We begin today's show in Lebanon, where Israel is expanding its attacks for the third day in a row, with Israeli warplanes striking deep in Lebanon amidst growing concern about a regional escalation. Today, an Israeli drone struck a car outside the Palestinian refugee camp of Rashidia, near the southern Lebanese city of Tyr, killing both passengers. This follows a pair of Israeli airstrikes Tuesday that killed two and wounded nine in northeastern Lebanon. On Monday, Israel struck areas near the Lebanese city of Baalbek. Lebanon's Hezbollah, which is an ally of Hamas, responded by launching a barrage of over 100 rockets at northern Israel Tuesday in what's been described as the heaviest attack since October 7th. For more, we're joined by Rami Khouri, Palestinian-American journalist, senior public policy fellow at the American University of Beirut. His most recent piece for Al Jazeera is headlined, Watching the Watchdogs, Biden, U.S. Media and Arab-American Political Power. Rami, welcome back to Democracy Now! We want to talk about Gaza Thank in a you. minute, but let's begin with Lebanon and what's happening uh, with the attacks between Israel and Lebanon. If you can talk about the significance, are we talking about an escalation into a regional war? What's happening on the border, Rami? Well, we are definitely witnessing an escalation that's been going on uh, since the beginning of the <clears throat> current phase of fighting in Gaza in early October. Uh, it's picked up a lot in the last two weeks. The Israelis have made it very clear in public statements openly. Uh, they want to uh, not destroy Hezbollah, but they want to reduce its power or uh, or neutralize it as a possible military force that will uh, threaten them, because they see Hezbollah correctly very closely linked to Iran, and they see Iran, I'm not so sure correctly, Israel sees Iran as its major threat uh, in the region. Uh, so they, the Israelis keep talking about, uh, we've got to do something about Hezbollah, including their willing to have a, a war, which they expect the Americans will come in and um, help them on, just as the Americans are helping them do the genocide in Gaza. And now the Americans, uh, oddly, are helping them do the uh, humanitarian food deliveries uh, into Gaza. So the United States seems to be a kind of uh, a button that Israel pushes when it needs assistance in some kind of dramatic, uh, usually uh, illegal and often ineffective action. It pushes the Washington button, and Washington uh, jumps up and says, yes, sir, what can I do? And uh, the Israelis expect the Americans to help them um, knock down Hezbollah's power. It's not clear that this is easily done. And the reason Hezbollah is so strong is because it forced Israel in 2006, in the last big war in Lebanon and Israel, forced it into a ceasefire and new rules of engagement, which have generally held and still kind of hold now, because it's sort of tit for tat. You, you kill one of our men, we kill one of yours. You attack a post, a military post, we attack one of yours. But this is escalating now, and uh, it's not clear if Israel is really uh, ready to, wants to actually have a full-scale war. Uh, neither side, I think, will uh, achieve very much other than massive destruction in both countries. So I, I remain skeptical about, about a full-scale war, but I'm uh, expecting this level of uh, tit-for-tat and even a higher level of assassinations, maybe hitting some infrastructure here and there. I expect that to, to ramp up a little bit, but not an all-out war. Uh, but already the the tit for tat uh, Rami Khouri has led to uh, considerable displacement. Some 90,000 people have been forced to flee southern Lebanon, uh, and at the same time, so about 80,000 Israelis have been evacuated from the northern towns and villages by the Israeli government. Uh, uh, if a greater conflict was to break out, what would be the impact, uh, in your assessment, throughout the Middle East? That's always difficult to predict. Uh, what we can predict, and we see it now, is that Arab governments will not risk anything in terms of helping the Palestinians or opposing the Israelis. They will issue statements, they'll do uh, press conferences, they'll uh, send some aid, uh, but they won't risk anything uh, strategic or substantive in confronting Israel. While the majority of Arab people are critical of Israel, but they're helpless. They have no power. They're, they're 
They used to be citizens. They've now been transformed into basically uh, consumers. All they can do is buy fried chicken and uh, go to the movies, um, and um, and the, the, they have no power. Arab citizens are powerless. Uh, they're neutered beings politically, and therefore the policies of Arab governments tend to uh, dominate. And that's why in the last 30 years, you've seen the rise of these very powerful non-state armed actors, Hezbollah and Hamas, and Saudallah and Yemen, the popular mobilization forces in Iraq and Syria, and, and, and a bunch of others. Um, and so what we would expect to see is more military action by some of these non-state, very powerful actors against Israel, if there's an all-out war. Um, and um, and the Arab countries, uh, you know, asking for a ceasefire. Uh, the Iranians are the big question mark. Would the Iranians get involved in a direct confrontation with Israel? My suspicion is that they probably would not want to do that um, because they know that that'll uh, bring in the Americans. Now, some people argue, well, that's what they want. They want the Americans to do another foolish military adventure like Vietnam, like Afghanistan, like Iraq, they would like the Americans to do uh, one more uh, uh, in um, in Iran. Um, so we, we, these are all speculative ideas. Nobody really uh, knows. The only thing we know for sure is that Hezbollah and Hamas and Ansarullah in Yemen, uh, the Houthis, uh, uh, they're ready to fight. They're prepared to fight. Whether this is a suicidal, uh, uh, you know, stupid policy is up for history to tell us. But what we've seen so far is that they have been able to uh, exchange fire with Israel and the U.S. in some cases and wake up and do it again the next day. This is not something that we should celebrate. We don't, you know, the Middle East as a cauldron of uh, nonstop violence, including the, what you mentioned, the huge amount of displaced civilians. This is painful to ordinary families. I, which, I witnessed it in Lebanon in Palestine, uh, in Jordan, and Syria, to see the refugees that have to run around when wars happen. Uh, you know, it happened in Iraq, it happened in Kuwait, uh, in Yemen, all over the place. Um, and, and we don't want to see another um, round of, of this. But this is the inevitable consequence of allowing the Arab-Israeli conflict to expand for a hundred years, for a century, with direct, explicit, ongoing and expanding American and British aid and arms and political protection at the UN. If you do that, this is what you're going to get. Uh, so it's kind of uh, insincere and rather immature and comic for American officials or British officials or to say, look, there's a danger uh, of a war. Of course there's a danger of a bigger war because your policies combined with the policies of the Israelis and some of the Arabs, have brought us to this point. So that if you want to stop a future war, you address the underlying uh, conditions. Why is there no big war in Afghanistan right now or Vietnam? It's because the underlying conditions were removed, and therefore there's a, some kind of normal situation. Well, you characterize Hezbollah as a non-state uh, actor, but uh, what about the relationship between Hezbollah and the Lebanese central government, for those people not familiar with, uh, with uh, Lebanese politics? Hezbollah is stronger than the Lebanese government militarily. There's no question about that. Um, but they recognize that they are part of the Lebanese government. They're in parliament. They have ministers in the government on and off. Uh, they, they're not an alien force. Uh, but they expanded and became strong because the Lebanese government was unable to protect the south of Lebanon in the 60s and 70s and 80s when it increasingly came under uh, threats from, uh, from Israel, when the Palestinians, uh, guerrillas, set up shop in South Lebanon at one point. That brought in Israeli reprisals. Uh, and, and because the Lebanese government could not protect Lebanon, Hezbollah emerged organically as uh, the military force that both protects uh, the South and protects all of Lebanon in cahoots with others in, in, in the country. There's other smaller leftists and other forces working with it. Um, and they have a very uneasy relationship because they are so powerful, they can spark a war, as has happened before, between Israel and, and Hezbollah, and the Lebanese government just can't do anything about it. And the Lebanese people suffer because the airport gets bombed, the electricity system stops. I mean, terrible things 
that happen uh, during war. And um, the Lebanese government constantly is trying to work out with Hezbollah an understanding uh, of how they can coexist. But this is really pretty impossible to do, again, until you resolve the underlying Arab-Israeli-Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And once that is resolved, there will be no need for Hezbollah to have all these arms to protect Lebanon from Israeli attacks, because Hezbollah is not going to go and try to destroy Israel. It's been clear that these groups, they're critical of Israel, they trash talk it, they badmouth it, they make all these threats, but they also negotiate with it, they make prisoner exchanges, and they've all made it clear. If the Palestinians reach an agreement with Israel that is fair to both sides, and the majority of Palestinian people support it, they will go along with it. There's no question about that. So we have to constantly uh, take our gaze away from the uh, uh, awful, uh, terrible things happening now or the potential for worse things to happen and look back on the central defining issue in this region. And there's two of those issues. One of them is nonstop foreign military intervention since Napoleon. And that foreign military uh, intervention is expanding, as we see now, especially with the Americans and the Russians and uh, Iranians and, and, and Turks and others, uh, and British. And the other one is the Arab-Israeli conflict. These are the two biggest drivers of regional tension and warfare uh, and instability, and those have to be addressed. So, Rami, let's talk about Gaza. The European Union's foreign policy chief has accused Israel of using starvation as a weapon of war by blocking aid from entering Gaza. The World Food Program managed to deliver aid to Gaza City for the first time Tuesday in three weeks, but the agency said famine's imminent in northern Gaza unless aid deliveries increase exponentially. Meanwhile, the U.S. says it's begun shipping parts to build a temporary port off the coast of Gaza to increase aid, while still shipping bombs to Israel to attack Gaza. Uh, Rami Khoury, if you can comment on this, and now Morocco saying it's worked out a deal with Israel, it's going to fly something like 40 tons of aid into Tel Aviv um, and then has secured a way to transport that aid over land through an Israeli crossing into Gaza. You know, there's all kinds of ideas being discussed about how do you reduce the uh, suffering of the Palestinians in Gaza because of the Israeli genocidal attack, which is directly supported and armed and funded by the United States. Um, one of these uh, issue, one of these ideas is to bring aid into Israel and ship it overland. Another one is to come up uh, from Egypt through the Sinai. The third one is to have direct flights or ships coming in uh, to Gaza. But all of these are patchwork band-aids that uh, don't really solve anything in the long run, because all you need is one attack by any group. Um, and there's many, you know, the Israelis or Hamas or some freelance uh, thugs, anybody could fire a rocket at one of these uh, aid uh, shipments, and the whole thing would come to a halt. Uh, so these are not serious uh, responses. Uh, you know, the Americans came up with the airdrop idea, and then they came up with the uh, floating uh, pontoon uh, dock um, about the same time as the uh, as the Oscars took place in uh, in Hollywood, this is entertainment. This is not serious diplomacy, or uh, or strategic stabilization uh, of the Middle East. This is sheer entertainment designed primarily to make Americans feel better about themselves because they are aware that they are uh, involved deeply in the genocidal assault by Israel on Gaza, um, and they are aimed primarily to help the Democratic Party. Uh, in the next presidential elections coming up in November, because the Democrats are, are facing serious pushback from a big coalition of Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, black Americans, Hispanics, progressive Jews, labor unions, all kinds of people who form the core heart of the Democratic Party traditionally. And they're basically now uh, thumbing their noses at, uh, at uh, Biden and saying, look, we don't play this game anymore where you just make promises and then continue your genocidal policies. And the, the significance of this is it's not just Arab Americans. And the media, as typically happens, with a few exceptions like you and a few others, the media in the US and, the, and most of Europe and, and, and England in particular, they just talk about, oh, the, the Arab Americans are complaining or Muslim Americans. It's much wider than that. Uh, Americans are fundamentally decent people. 
They don't like to see their, fund, their money and their guns and their uh, government supporting what has now been called a plausible genocide by the big, highest court of the world. And th this is serious stuff. And the American citizens don't feel comfortable being associated with this kind of criminality. Uh, but for the government to respond with theatrics and uh, cartoon-like uh, uh, efforts to show how effective their technology is and what amazing things uh, we can do, this is not serious. The Americans really haven't thought out all the implications of this uh, uh, shipping by air or by pontoon bridges or boats or, or whatever, uh, the distribution of the food. UNRWA is the most efficient food distributor in Gaza, and the United States is trying to destroy UNRWA because Israel asked it to. Uh, and Israel asked the United States, pushes the red button when it needs American uh, criminal assistance, and the Americans tend to respond most of the time. And the Americans uh, defunding uh, UNRWA is, is, is a criminal activity because it has massive implications for the well-being and, and even survival of Palestinians in Gaza and many other uh, refugee camps around, uh, around the region. So if, there, if the U.S. is serious about uh, helping reduce civilian suffering in Gaza, uh, it has very, very simple, uh, quick ways to do it, which is to, uh, to lay down the law with the Israelis and say, look, you're, you're not going to get we're not going to remain complicit in this genocide of yours. Uh, you have to stop uh, obstructing the delivery of food and, and medicine and other things into Gaza, um, or else we're going to stop the delivery of arms uh, and funds and diplomatic protection uh, at the UN. This is a tough position for the U.S. to take. It has taken similar positions a few times in the past, uh, but you have to have resolve. You have to have... Uh, uh, serious analysis in the White House, uh, and you have to have a, a wellspring of decency and, and ethical behavior, all three of which are now missing uh, from the White House policy on foreign policy uh, in the Middle East. But Rami Khoury, the, the, this bizarre plan for, uh, a, for a temporary peer, uh, Given the fact that it would take us as much as two months uh, to to prepare, isn't that effectively the United States recognizing that this war, uh, this genocidal war, is going to go on much longer than most, I guess, of the American public expected? Absolutely. This is exactly the point I'm trying to make, that the, the United States and Great Britain, most of all, among the Western countries, are explicitly, openly, even enthusiastically supporting the plausible genocide that Israel is carrying out. And this is one of the great uh, mysteries of, uh, of modern times. Why would two countries like the U.S. and the U.K., which boast about their commitment to democracy and human rights and equality and all of these good things, why would they be so uh, emphatic and so consistent uh, in supporting this, they don't have a problem with um, 30,000 Palestinians killed and hundreds of thousands injured or replaced. They clearly don't have a problem with it. Their words mean nothing. Their actions speak uh, volumes about what they truly feel uh, uh, in their hearts. Uh, this is the government. The people of these countries are, are, mu are much better than that. Uh, but the U.S. and U.K. and a few other countries are all out supporting Israel in doing this, and they have been since 1917, when England issued the Balfour Declaration. That's why we say you've got to look at the historical context. In 1917, the United Kingdom uh, issued a Balfour Declaration to the small, young Zionist movement in Europe, saying we support the creation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, and Palestine was 95% Arab. There was a small Jewish community that had always existed there uh, and should always exist there, uh, but it was 95 percent Arab. Uh, it's like me saying there should be a Palestinian homeland uh, in the center of Manhattan. It just is not, po it's not right. It's not possible. You can't take somebody else's land and create your own country. And since 1917, the Zionist movement, then the State of Israel, supported by the U.S. and U.K. and others, has enthusiastically pursued the plan to diminish the number of Palestinians living in Palestine so you can have a, a exclusively a Jewish state, which is the government policy now of this government uh, in Israel. But it has failed. It has failed because the number of Palestinians between the historic Palestine from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea 
which includes Israel and some of the occupied territories, there are more Palestinians now than Israelis, more uh, Christian and Muslim Palestinians than Jewish Israelis. Uh, so not only is the Israeli plan uh, vicious and cruel and criminal, uh, it's also ineffective. And the United States is uh, pursuing its amateurish, comic, uh, entertainment-based, cartoon-like foreign policy to support this, knowing that it's going to fail. And, you know, the airdrops were the best example of this. The poor, those five poor kids who were killed by these, uh, you know, food packets uh, that fell on them and killed them. Th this is unbelievable that the United States would carry out these kinds of policies. The, the pontoon bridge is uh, another one. There's so many ramifications of that also that haven't been ex discussed or explored in terms of what it's going to mean in terms of uh, re re recreating Israeli direct security control mechanisms in Gaza to protect the food and allow it to be distributed. Who's going to dis distribute it? Is this going to create new mechanisms which already are starting to take shape now? of uh, lawless uh, gang-like behavior among starving, desperate Palestinians. And this is human nature. Anybody who's starving um, uh, and desperate is going to create gangs and to go get the food and distribute it. And this is exactly uh, w what's happening. And this is exactly what the Israelis want. They want the Palestinians to, to uh, act in this manner. And therefore, the Israelis can show the world, look at these, these people. These are animals, these Palestinians. Um, and they want to drive them out. And th there's another fear also that if UNRWA is not uh, allowed to continue its activities, uh, the, the distribution process will end up being either politicized or criminalized. And, and this is uh, with the direct involvement of the Israelis and the Americans and some Arab countries. And this is also uh, not a very, uh, very good, I good idea. Rami uh, So there are many... Th we want to thank you so much for being with us, um, Palestinian-American journalist, senior pol public policy fellow at the American University of Beirut, um, joining us today from New York.